When we use a modern computer, we're standing on the shoulders of giants so tall that the details are obscured by clouds. It's just far too complicated for any one person to truly understand at any level of detail, but that wasn't always the case. Today in Dave's Garage, we're getting medieval with an old computer to investigate some of the most basic technologies that we all overlook in our daily computing. The things that you should know how they work, but you probably don't. We're going back in time to revisit some of the details that we all take for granted today. You might know how a keyboard works, but do you know how the system scans a hundred or more keys with just a few I.O. lines? Do you know when and why a computer designer might favor static RAM over dynamic RAM? Do you know how the most basic green phosphor monitor actually puts text characters on the screen? Do you know how to add two floating point numbers in assembly language? Well, in about 15 minutes, you're going to know all those things and a lot more, so stick around. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're taking a deep dive into an old machine in order to go back to basics and make sure that you know how a computer actually works. I don't mean in general, I mean the details like when the machine boots, what's the first instruction that it executes and how does it even know where to find that? How does a character definition in memory become a picture of a letter on a screen? The basics. I've been doing this long enough that I can remember the days when you could, for all intents and purposes, know all there was to know about a particular system. It's an awesome feeling, really, and it's a luxury that's pretty much disappeared in modern computing, and I think young developers in particular are worse off because of it. Dave Cutler once said of Windows that it was so big, so much code, that no one mind could comprehend it all. And that was 30 years ago, in 1992, when it was literally about one-tenth the size that it is today. And he was the chief architect. I'd say that MS-DOS on the IBM PC was about the last time that one mind could comprehend the whole thing. But it was never true for me personally. Though I worked on MS-DOS itself, and wrote a lot of x86 assembly for it, I stayed pretty much entirely on the I.O. side of things with disk compression and copying and caching, so I knew a lot about a little slice of the system. Then I moved to Windows NT where, again, I knew a lot about a few pieces, but had only a general knowledge of components that I never touched, like audio or printing. The last time I think I knew a whole system inside and out would be the 8-bit days, working on Commodore hardware like the PET and C64. Now, I do not claim to know everything there is to know about a C64, for example. While there's nothing in the programmer's reference manual that would likely surprise me, I'm sure there are lots of weird edge cases for behaviors on the SID and VIC chips that I've never even heard of. Nor do I mean that I know more than anyone else. I'm sure if Jim Butterfield and I were on Jeopardy together and the category were as the Commodore PET, I'd only win by virtue of the fact that Jim died 15 years ago now. For me, it's not about knowing every obscure piece of technical trivia, but rather, it really boils down to knowing how every aspect of the machine works so that you can explain each part without hand-waving. For example, when you press the down arrow key on a pet, a lot happens. It's not enough to know that there's a function called carry in that you can call to retrieve whatever the character code is. Because ideally, you should be aware that there's a keyboard scan using multiple chips on the motherboard, ROM routines to handle the screen editor, zero page locations to keep track of the current cursor position after updating screen memory, and kernel functions that you should know that control all of it. And that's just for one key on the keyboard. So you may not know every detail, but when you have a firm grasp of the big picture, the details that you do know can be seen in context. It's clear then that I can't tell you everything there is to know in 15 minutes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to paint you a mental picture of the pet, just like AOL used to download images from the web. A blurry overview at first and then progressively refining the details as the picture comes into view. I absolutely guarantee that when we're done, you're going to understand a computer at a completely new level. Not a guarantee. If I'm successful, then by the end of this episode, you'll have a much crisper picture in your head of not only what a simple computer is made up of, but also how it works. But which computer? I was tempted to do the Commodore 64, due in no small part to its massive popularity. But between sound and video, there's just enough going on there that I don't think I could do it justice in one episode. So I'm going to go one step even further back, as I hinted, to the Commodore PET, which is very much like the C64 but without the fancy sound and video hardware. Otherwise, the machines are remarkably similar and even largely compatible with one another. Almost everything I say about the PET will be true of the C64 as well. Sure, the screen memory and other things move around in the memory map and so on, and the video is totally different, but most of the pet architecture survives on directly in the C64. Now, if your brain works anything like mine, it helps to have a mental overview of the whole machine. 
I'm going to give you two visuals with which to anchor your knowledge, the system memory map and the motherboard itself. Let's start with the motherboard. I took this photo of my very own pet and I added labels to what I think are the important parts. At the top, we have the CPU and the I.O. chips, and in the middle are the ROMs, and at the bottom, the system RAM. There's no sound chip and no video chip, but clearly there's some video circuitry of some kind because it has a crisp 40x25 character display. So how do they do that? How does a simple computer even display characters on a screen? It's not magic, so how do they accomplish it? Well, it's both simple and genius. As programmers, the part we care about the most is the character generator ROM, the heart of the system. They call it a character generator, but it's simply a ROM with circuitry to point the source of the electron gun at the right place in that ROM. There's no special fancy hardware to create characters, no sprites, no special effects. Each character on the screen is just an 8x8 grid that is effectively copied directly from the ROM to the screen with the beam on when the bit is set and the beam off when the bit is clear. But how does it copy the character to the screen? Well, it simply looks at the right place in a particular ROM for the bytes that define what the character looks like. In other words, the job of the video hardware is really to point the electron gun's source at the right bit in the character definition in the ROM. Then whatever pattern it is in the ROM will be lit on the screen phosphor. As the electron beam scans, the current XY position determines which byte of screen memory is being displayed. Working within the margins of the 40x25 screen, with each character cell being an 8x8 grid, our actual resolution is thus 320x200. The hardware fetches that byte of screen memory, and let's say it's the letter E, which is the screen code 5. That means that the letter E is the fifth entry in the character ROM. Every letter is an 8x8 monochrome grid, meaning that each letter takes up 8 bytes of 8 bits in that ROM. Thus, to find our offset in the character ROM table, we simply take the character code and multiply it by 8. And then here's the genius part. They simply take the lower 3 bits of the current scan line, and that's how many bytes deep you are into the character definition. Let's look at a concrete example. The letter E in the top left corner of the screen. We start at scan line 0. When the electron gun reaches the left edge of the character, we need to fetch the byte from ROM that corresponds to the first or top byte of the character definition. Since the code for E is 5, we multiply by 8 bytes per character to get the 40th byte in the ROM. Since we're on scan line 0, we don't have to index in any further, and hence, we fetch the bytes directly. The bits are then clocked out to the gun from highest to lowest, which is left to right in the character definition. It's ironic that despite all of its simple elegance, there's one glaring design shortcoming in the pet that I've never understood. The character ROM is fixed. Had they allowed you to specify a location in RAM as the base address of where the video circuitry went to look for in memory for the character definitions, you could define your own characters. Each of the 256 characters is in its own little 8x8 bitmap and can be reused on the screen as often as you like. This is how the C64 works, and along with sprites and smooth scrolling, it's one of the graphics technologies that allowed the 64 to become a gaming phenomenon in its day, but it's curiously absent on the pet. Imagine you wanted to find a custom character, like the copyright symbol. Uh, if it were possible, you would simply copy the existing character data from the ROM to somewhere in RAM, and then you would modify the definition for your special character uh, by replacing a character like the back arrow, perhaps, and it becomes a copyright symbol. Then you modify the base address of the character table to point to your customized copy. You can customize as many or as few as you like, and it would also be trivial to load a custom character set from disk. Changing fonts would be one load command and two pokes away. Now, I'm not a hardware guy, so I don't know how much it actually saved them in circuitry, speed, or complexity to have the character ROM effectively dedicated to the video circuit lookup on the pet. The ROM is only even wired up to the video circuit and isn't exposed to the CPU or present in the memory map. In other words, you can't get there from here. If you have a theory as to why they couldn't let the video circuitry pull character definitions from RAM instead, please let me know in the comments as I'm curious. My best guess at this point is that the character definitions take up 2K, so perhaps on a 4K machine, it just wasn't practical enough to be a big priority. But you could write some killer games on a 16K pet had it allowed for custom character bitmaps. One curiosity of the PET is that it uses static RAM and not dynamic RAM or DRAM as we usually call it. Because they were dealing with an incredibly small amount of memory at only 4K in the original config and because 4K of RAM of any kind was expensive to begin with at the time, they opted to go with static RAM. Well, what's the difference? Well, static RAM holds its contents for as long as power is supplied to the chip. Store a number in SRAM and come back an hour later, it's still there. Dynamic RAM, however, requires additional circuitry to continually refresh the contents of the RAM to keep it fresh. Without that refresh, it loses its contents. 
So static RAM seems preferable, and it is in a number of ways, but it does cost more. On the C64, they would add custom logic to the VEC chip to do the DRAM refresh for them, but there's no comparable chip in the PET, so static RAM avoids the need to do a refresh circuit at all. It's time to jump into the memory map so that we can place everything where it belongs. Being able to see the whole thing as a bird's eye view is invaluable in understanding the entire system. All RAM appears in the memory map starting at address 0. On a 4K PET, your RAM thus appears from 0000 to 0FFF. The PET is built around the 6502 CPU, and that dictates that the first page of memory, known as zero page, is special. It's essentially a set of 128 16-bit pointers. Or you can use them as bytes too, but they're handy as pointers. The second page of memory is also special, as it's the location of the stack. It can't grow outside of that page, so it's limited to 256 bytes. RAM can be added to a limit of 32K max, meaning the top of memory would then be 7FFF. Regardless of how much system RAM you have, the PET has an additional 1,000 bytes of static screen RAM mapped into memory at location 8,000. The memory is in addition to the base system RAM, so your 4K PET actually has 5K bonus. Above the screen RAM are the ROM sockets. Each one is 4K, except for the ROM at E000, which is only 2K, but more about that one later. At 9000 and A000 are two 4K ROM sockets that are delivered empty on the PET. They're considered expansion ROMs. The biggest problem is that most of the available expansion ROMs all competed for the same address because 6502 code is not relocatable. The addresses for loads and jumps, for example, are hard-coded into it. B000 is another 4K empty ROM socket. I mention it separately only because later pets that had BASIC 4, which was bigger, contained a ROM in this location. My own machine has indeed been upgraded to BASIC 4, which is why we see a ROM installed in that location in the picture. At C000 and D000, we find two 4K ROMs for Microsoft BASIC. I think it's fairly impressive that BASIC fits in 8K, to be honest. As mentioned, the ROM at E000 is only 2K. That leaves the top half of what would otherwise be a 4K ROM as a 2K block of empty, unused addresses where the system I.O. chips are mapped into memory. But in fact, only a single page from E800 to E8FF is actually used. In this area, we find the registers for two Peripheral Interface Adapters, or PIA chips. One is dedicated to the keyboard and cassette ports, while the other is intended for talking to the IEEE bus that early Commodore disk drives would actually use. Next comes the VIA chip, or Versatile Interface Adapter. It primarily controls the user port, timers, and the second cassette interface. There are a number of port registers exposed, and programming it reminds me a lot of programming something like an Arduino Nano in that you set the data direction appropriately and then read and write bits manually. This chip has 16 GPIO lines and half of them are available for your use. Those eight are exposed at the user port. The most common use of those lines is to implement RS-232C, which is a variant of serial that runs at 5 volts instead of 12 volts. You could use the ports to communicate with a microcontroller, PC, or modem. Given a mental picture of where things live in the memory map, let's now turn our attention to the system mainboard where you'll discover that there was a method to my madness, as it were, because the physical layout of the mainboard follows the memory map layout in the same order that we just covered it. For example, at the bottom of the board is system RAM. Next above that is the screen RAM. Off to the side of that, because it's not even visible on the system bus, is the character generator ROM. Above that are found the system ROM chips. The CPU and I.O. are up near the top of the board in the same way that the I.O. chips are near the top of memory. Now that we know all the major components in the system and where they live in the memory map and on the board itself, it's time to ask how they work. When you turn the machine on, how does it know where to start up? Well, for that, we turn to the 6502 datasheet, which tells us how the boot sequence happens. First, the CPU loads the address out of memory at FFFC and FFFD. That's true for every 6502 ever made. It's how everyone starts up which means that there must be ROM up at the top of memory for it to read, and we saw that in the memory map, the kernel lives up at the top of memory. If we look at the source code for the pet kernel, we can see three important vectors at the top of memory. Two interrupt vectors in addition to our reset vector. The reset vector is set to point at the label start, so let's take a look at that code. The code is fairly straightforward. It initializes a stack pointer, disables interrupts, turns off decimal math mode, and then proceeds to initialize I.O. and get the system running before it hands control off to the screen editor and basic interpreter. But what is the kernel? Well, just as the BIOS is a set of routines that allows the operating system to communicate with and control the underlying hardware of a PC, the kernel routines provide all of the system-specific functionality that BASIC needs to get its job done. 
If you've ever called JSR FFD2 on C64 to output a character to the screen, that's an example of a kernel call. On the PET, the goal was strictly to provide a set of routines that would provide Microsoft with a way to access the Commodore hardware, screen editor, and so on. It wouldn't truly become a public system API well organized and so on until the VIC-20. Clearly, the bulk of the functionality that the PET provides is thanks to the code included in the kernel and basic ROMs. I should be clear that I'm lumping the screen editor in with the kernel. In fact, the delineation is really more practically between Commodore code and Microsoft code. One important feature that I assume found itself on the Commodore list of things to do was the keyboard scanning routine. The ROM code uses one of the PIA chips to talk to the keyboard as a matrix. Several times per second, the ROM cycles between rows 1 to 10 in the keyboard. That binary number is sent to a decoder chip with 10 lines, and those lines are used one at a time to power rows on the keyboard. If the signal from row 8 comes back on column 3, then the system knows exactly which key is pressed. Let's say the key in question is the E key. The code for E, which is 5, is then stored at the position in screen memory that the current cursor position is at. Then the cursor is updated by moving it right one position, which will update the position values down in zero page. The screen editor was provided by Commodore and was quite innovative for its day. Rather than accumulating a single line of input and then executing it when you pressed enter, the pet went about it in a very unique way. You could type anywhere on the screen. When the ready prompt emerged, the cursor would be placed directly below it, but you were free to use the cursor keys to move the cursor anywhere and type anything. Only when you pressed enter did the system snap to attention and attempt to execute something. Whatever line the cursor happened to be on would be passed entirely to the basic interpreter. So, if you could enter a line like 10 go to 20, and then you realize later that you made an error, instead of retyping or editing the line, you could actually simply just cursor back up to it and change the 20 to a 30. As long as you pressed enter on that line, the new version would be committed and passed to the basic interpreter. It would see the line number and replace the line 10 with the new version that you had just submitted. This explains why, when you press enter on a screen line that contains the ready prompt, it dutifully reports out of data error. The reason? Well, you've pressed enter on the text ready, which thus gets passed to the basic interpreter. It sees the command as read Y, but when it tries to execute it, no matching data statements have yet been executed, so there's no data to be read. Want to verify that? Well, try it after providing a data 10 line and then removing the period at the end. It will read Y from your data statement and you can print Y to confirm it. Let's have a quick look at the basic ROM to see what's included within it. Of course, it has the tokenizing basic interpreter, but it has many support routines that you can make use of, including a very optimized floating point math library. Let's have a quick look at how to call the math libraries on the PET. Imagine we want to add two 16-bit quantities and then print the result. First, we need to load an integer quantity into the floating point accumulator. There are two such accumulators, which are really just memory addresses used as storage by the math routines. To load our value into the first one, we put the least significant byte into the Y register and the upper byte into the A register. We then call int fp and our 16-bit floating point accumulator is loaded from these two 8-bit registers. Next, we would move the value from fac1 to fac2 using the fac12 function, and then load the second value just as we did the first using int fp. Next, we simply call add, and the accumulator1 is now the sum of accumulator1 and accumulator2. We can then call fp out to print the result to the console. There's more to it, like Commodore's I.O. system of devices and channels, but quite honestly, it's largely the same as what you do through Commodore Basic. The only catch is that some commands take more arguments than you have registers, and as a result, basic commands like open get broken down into a couple of discrete steps. You load the device number and the file number in one step and call listen, and then second to set the secondary address. We've covered a great deal, from the video system and I.O. chips to two types of RAM, as well as the major sections of ROM, kernel, and basic. And yet even so, we never even touched cassette I.O. or the IEEE interface. But those things are really quite specific to the PET itself. We covered everything you need to make a working computer with a CRT and a keyboard interface, and that's the main goal that I set out to accomplish today. If I've made any mistakes, which is almost inevitable in an episode like this where it'll be seen by people that know more than I do about the subject, please do let me know and I'll update the description with any errata. If you don't see any, that means I achieved perfection, or that I forgot to add it. If you enjoyed this little intense tour of the pet, I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to my channel so that you get more like it. I'm really only in this for the subs and likes, so please leave me one of each before you go. Share it, like it, comment on it, and if there's interest in this kind of topic, I'll keep right on going with a more detailed version of the pet and perhaps a similar dive into the Commodore 64. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.